Well, good evening and welcome. Welcome to this service on Epiphany Sunday, the first service of this new year. It is an honor and a blessing to get to share in, in worshiping the Lord together. My name is Kaylin Gale. You can probably tell that I'm not Clive and that this is my first time here at Chateau Day. And I'm the youth and children's minister at All Saints Bove, where Clive is also pastor. So I hope that we will have a great time celebrating the start of a new year as the body of Christ and as well continuing in the adventure of exploring God's word. So I would invite us all to take this, this first few minutes and to share in a carol. This is a carol that is more of an Advent and a Christmas carol and yet was brought together, compiled by members of church communities all across the archdeaconry. And I would like to leave us with, with an opening thought on coming to the house. On coming to the house, they presented, the wise men saw the child with his mother and they bowed down and worshiped him. And now we will hear our first carol. So as we continue in this service, let us extend a welcome to the God who welcomes us. I invite you to read with me the, the lines in orange type. Wise God, you are older than the ages and you dance in the starlight and you love us. Wise God, you share your bread with strangers and welcome us as little children and you understand us. Wise God, you perplex the powers and comfort all who mourn, and you disturb us. 
wise God, shining in darkness, seen by those who love you, found by those who seek you. We have come to worship you. Kings and kingdoms, weak and strong, all are coming to meet with God. Sons and daughters, poor and rich, all are coming to meet with God. Scholars and shepherds, simple and sage, all are coming to meet with God. And as all are coming to meet with God, we rejoice that God comes to meet with us on this, on this epiphany, excuse me, I was about to say Advent, on this Epiphany Sunday, we, we continue with perhaps the most famous Epiphany hymn of all, We Three Kings. So we continue in our worship with the time of confession. Christ, the perfect light of the world, has come to dispel the darkness of our hearts. In his light, let us examine ourselves and confess our sins. Lord of grace and truth, we confess our unworthiness to stand in your presence as your children. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The Virgin Mary accepted your call to be the mother of Jesus. Forgive our disobedience to your will. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. Your son, our savior, was born in poverty in a manger. Forgive our greed and rejection of your ways. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. The shepherds left their flocks to go to Bethlehem. Forgive our self-interest and lack of vision. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. 
The wise men followed the star to find Jesus the King. Forgive our reluctance to seek you. We have sinned. Forgive and heal us. And we will say it together. Make our trust more certain. Make our love more real. Make our worship more pleasing. For your glory's sake. Amen. And he who is the light of the world assures us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May God Almighty have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all of our sins, confirm and strengthen us by God's Holy Spirit, and raise us to life everlasting through Christ our Lord. Amen. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. So we will continue in our time of worship with a reading of scripture. And I would like to invite Cece to, to read Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thank you so much for that reading. Let's take a moment to pray, shall we? Father, we, we love you, and we know that first and foremost, we're loved by you. So take this time, take this word, and apply it to our hearts, that we might go out from here a people enlivened by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So if 2020 has taught us anything, it may be this. Be ready for anything and everything. In the words of one unnamed but oft quoted wise guy, hindsight is 2020. And I'm guessing that you will agree with me on this. How glad can we be to have 2020 in hindsight, in the rear view? But there's also this ever present realization, which I'd like to call 2020 vision, if you'll pardon the pun. And that is that quite frankly, 
we cannot be prepped enough, briefed enough, even prayed up enough to anticipate all the craziness of a year like the one we just came out of. And I say just came out of because as of three days ago, we've crossed over, sigh of relief, into this new year, into 2021. Humanity, battered and bruised, has survived, and the world still turns, although with a few screws loose and more masks around the place and, and more trials and tragedies faced, but we have survived. And on a liturgical note, for the church calendar, we're standing not only on the other side of 2020, but on the other side of the Christmas season, the Sunday known as Epiphany. Epiphany is that fun to spell Greek word that means shining on or appearance. And I think you can probably guess why. And there's some major mileage to the Epiphany story. And we'll, we'll get to Mary and Joseph and Herod and the star, but the folks I really want to focus on are the wise men or the wise guys as my vernacular take on those early gift givers of Christmas past goes. My question really to us is what do wise guys do? And if we are going into 2021, hopefully a little bit more aware, hopefully a little more wise with our 2020 vision, what might that mean? What do wise guys do? Wise guys ask for help. I invite you to think of the wisest person you know. Or second wisest, if you're having to choose between Clive and someone else. Whose wisdom has shaped your life? Who has, who has made you a better person through the way that they applied knowledge? Because wisdom is not the same as knowledge. We've all, we've all heard this before. Right, smarts are great. Smarts are great. I'm sure that on this call, in this, in this sanctuary, we have a lot of smart people. And smarts will tell you a whole bunch of stuff. Smarts will, will give you calculations and equations for, for gravitational pull. But wisdom, wisdom will tell you not to get too close to a cliff. And smarts will tell you how to figure out that speed is equal to distance over time. But wisdom will say, maybe I shouldn't walk into traffic. There's a difference between having smarts and having them applied into real life situations. And I'm convinced personally that what is needed, perhaps most, what is sought after from those within and outside the church is not necessarily a smarter Christianity. It's great to know our Bible verses. It's great to be able to recite our creeds. That's all, that's all wonderful and blessed and God ordained. But when it comes down to it, most people aren't asking, man, I wish I could get another Bible verse in my mind. I wish I could figure out uh, the 66 books in, in alphabetical and chronological and canonical order. Most people are just trying to figure out how to live right. Most people just want to know from the moment that I wake up till I put my head down on the pillow, I want to know that I'm doing something with my life that has meaning, that speaks to my heart, that speaks to the needs of this world, that takes the gifts that I've been given and puts them into something bigger than myself. And then we're talking about wisdom. Wise guys ask for help. The Magi, not kings, not necessarily three, were smart. And smart is an understatement because they were, they were brilliant. You think about this, back before the Hubble telescope, before the International Space Station, before all of the, the observatories that we have in our world today, these guys were charging the stars with their eyes and their minds. And not only were they charting the stars, but they were taking what they got from charting the stars and bringing it down and saying, this is what this means for the world that we live in. They were brilliant. A category of nobility from outside the Jewish faith. We, we see them in Matthew, but also in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, in Jeremiah, and outside the Bible, they're mentioned. They were very clever folks whose book learning and whose discernment of the stars was impressive but not without limits. Their journey began to Bethlehem with the supernatural revealed. They saw his star rising. They saw his star in the east, another translation says. But it only continued with question, a humbling of self to seek out someone else's guidance. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? 
Jesus may be the greatest epiphany, but another epiphany we have to deal with and we have to learn is to recognize the voice of God in the unlikely circumstance, in the unlikely sources. From the very beginning of the nativity story, God reveals God's wisdom in the unlikeliness of places. In this chapter of Matthew, God doesn't start with the priests in the temple, but he starts with these foreign wise guys, guys from out of town, from outside of the realm of Judaism. And then we rewind a little bit and God is speaking first, not to these wise men, but to unqualified shepherds with no degrees, no pedigree, nothing to commend them to this gigantic revelation of the birth of Jesus. And then we rewind a little bit more and God has spoken to Joseph, a man who has been trodden upon by taxation from an unjust government, pledged to be married to a wife who is already pregnant with someone else's child. And before that, before that, God reveals that the son of God, the savior of all mankind, the Lord of creation is going to show up and he reveals it first to a servant girl in the sticks of Nazareth. We must always be ready for God to reveal who God is through the unlikely sources. And we get that from 2020 vision as well, from the nearly countless reassessments of policies on who can be near whom, for how long, with or without a mask, how many times a day. And each time, it means deferring to other voices. It has meant often voices from outside of our church community, from outside our homes, from outside of our local governments, even sometimes from beyond our country of residence. And while it's been a harrowing experience, I feel like this in some way, this vision is what we can carry forward into a new year of a still new decade. To let go of self is one of the great gifts of the incarnation. And in a lesser way, it's that same gift that brings the wise men to the royalty in Jerusalem. And it brings them to the Hebrew scriptures that foretell that the true king, the king of the Jews will be born in the city of David. And likewise, 2020 vision may mean letting God speak through the unlikely circumstance, the foreign voice from beyond our borders, from beyond our customs, even from beyond our faith. Speaking frankly, I feel like we've got a lot of preparation coming as, as a church. I can say this, I'm, I get to serve in Vuve, but all of us who have benefited from the blessing of having the Atkinsons minister for so long, we're coming to a season that is rather crucial. And God is calling us to a willingness to receive voices from those outside of our four walls, always with godly discernment, but still with an openness to hear what the spirit is saying. I find it interesting that the wise men often get compared with Balaam. Folks probably remember Balaam from Numbers in the Old Testament, Numbers 22 through 25. Balaam was a seer like the wise men who came from outside of Israel. And like Herod, he had to humble himself and take advice from a donkey. He had to hear the voice of God from an unlikely source. But he, like the wise men, also became an unlikely source because though he was a seer, though he was not from the children of Israel, God used him, his words, his voice to speak blessing over the entire people of Israel. And so the wise men likewise bring blessing because they're able to humble themselves to seek where they needed to go. They had the why, but they had to humble themselves for the where. Bethlehem wasn't the tourist destination that it is today. It took reliance on the word of God beyond training, beyond learning, beyond the supernatural to understand what they thought they might already have known. Wise guys ask for help. Wise guys also don't show up empty handed. All of the Magi show up with something. Royalty connoted by gold, divinity connoted by frankincense, myrrh foreshadowing the sacrifice that this child would one day make with his life. And as a people who hope to be wise, a people seeking to be wise guys in this next year, let's not assume that following Jesus comes without cost. 
The wise men's gifts were definitely top tier. You could find them with the pricier tags in a manor, but I'm not talking about the cost of money. I'm talking about the cost of humility and faith because each of these gifts wasn't just a statement of who Jesus was. It was also a statement of what humanity is not. To bring gold to a king was to acknowledge that his position surpassed their own. And so it wasn't just gold, it was a surrendering of status. Frankincense meant an acknowledgement of deity. Often frankincense was used in both in the Old Testament and elsewhere for fragrant offerings to God. And perhaps even implicit in the frankincense was a choice, a choice to turn from worship of other so-called divinities that were part of the wise men's culture. T.S. Eliot wrote a poem about the wise men and puts himself in the wise guy's shoes and says, we returned to our places, but no longer at ease there in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. And so frankincense wasn't necessarily just frankincense, but a surrendering of systems that were sacred. And myrrh was used for burials. We see it elsewhere in the Bible in, in John chapter 19. Nicodemus goes to the tomb of Jesus with about 100 pounds of aloes mixed with myrrh. And it was used for burial and it meant that someone would die and die in an important way for humanity. And what that means is whoever gave it needed saving, needed a sacrifice. And so it wasn't just myrrh, it was a surrendering of self-sufficiency. And let's not forget all of these, gold, frankincense, and myrrh are placed before a baby. A baby. And his probably illiterate mom and workaday dad, who may have taken years to piece together what the symbolism was, what it all meant, a baby with no crown and no court. I have two small children, one is about five months. And in light of that, I now wonder if when he was first given it, baby Jesus tried to chew on the gold. I mean, it's, it's crazy, a baby. To me, it's as crazy as an alabaster jar broken at a carpenter's feet. It's as audacious as a fisherman stepping into the sea to follow his teacher and his best friend. When we, by faith, bow the knee in our 21st century, self-made, self-deified Western world to a Middle Eastern man whom we can't see, but whom we love as God, whose followers are all mixed up and whose church is sometimes anything other than what he said it should be, when we do that, we are doing something radical. What we lay down at the feet of Jesus is just as important as what we take up for him this year. Wise guys don't come empty handed. And wise guys know how to change course. It's not about how we got here, it's about where he's leading. So I have to say something on Herod because why not, right? So the Herod hustle was all about self-preservation. It was a colossal time bomb of insecurities and grasping frantically at proof of superiority. And I know that we only know these things to be true in other people's lives and not our own. Anytime you as a king are known throughout history for taking out your own sons and a wife for fear of being overthrown, you know that you're in over your head. And perhaps in our own less overtly murderous ways, we too can evince self-centeredness, rooted in fear, ultimately, that the life that we've built for ourselves, which in all truth, God has blessed us to build, will fall apart if we dare allow someone else to sit on the throne of our lives. But we can't grow as the people of love that Christ calls us to be if we're obsessed with our own survival. Christianity was never to have been about an empire, but about a kingdom. And not a kingdom performed in palaces, but lived amongst the unlovable and the lost. I have a privilege of serving on staff at a church. 
and I can say as one with my pay, my lodging, my professional identity tethered to church as someone having grown up in church for almost literally as long as I can remember, I will make this very clear. God's heart is not ultimately for the church. God's heart is not ultimately for the church. It is expressed through the church for the world. Wise men know to change course. God's words to the wise men are clear. You need to go home a different way. The journey cannot follow the course it was on before. And if we hear these words as a hopefully wise church in the coming year, we may realize that we cannot continue our adventure in faith exactly the same way that we have done to this point. And that's not because what was done before was bad. I'll ask a question. I won't expect a show of hands, but you didn't go back to leftovers of Christmas dinner from 2019 for this holiday season, did you? If someone raises a hand, I'll, I'll be a little flummoxed. Why not? They were good, right? But they were from last year. You get your tires checked, sometimes replaced. Were the old tires bad when you first bought them? No, but they were from last year. We are people of Christmas hope, rooted in ordinary times, bearing witness to an Easter Christ. And we are loved by a Christ who is risen and who doesn't stop raising us up from where we were comfortable, who says in dreams and visions and stables and stars and plain old ordinary language, see, I am doing a new thing. What it means quite simply is that the old way to Bethlehem worked for the first leg, it worked. But the way home had to change because the revelation had changed. And sometimes a new way home means letting go of whatever or whoever is not on the side of God's newness of life. And the wise men got that memo. They realized they were on the side of the Messiah, which meant that their loyalty to Herod was null and void. And Herod had given them the satnav. He and the priests told the wise men where to go, how to find the baby Jesus. They had done something that was good but all of it came with a wringing of hands and crossed fingers behind the back because the palace was a place of worry and not of worship. As God welcomes us into this new year, we have to be honest with God and with ourselves about the weights and the snares that keep us safely nailed to the spot that we can handle, but far below the heights to which God wants us to soar. And Herod, I think it's interesting to note, Herod doesn't necessarily have personal aversion to the wise men. He's not out for their blood, even though they're the ones who called Jesus the king. In some ways, he's almost rooting for them to get where they want to go. He just wants to destroy what they stand for. Sometimes God allows us the hard but liberating realization that folks can be in your corner without wanting your best. They can be for you as a person They can want what's good for you, but not what is God's for you. Wise guys discern when people pay lip service to your marriage, but they try to keep you out late every other night. They discern when when colleagues and friends smile at the word church, like it can't be helped, but then plan all of your hangouts for Sundays. Wise guys discern when you commit to being financially secure and getting out of debt And yet folks are wondering why you won't upgrade and why you won't keep up with the Joneses and do this and do that. Wise guys see when people are for you, but not for God in you. And we've got to discern in this coming year and let go and be willing to go another way than that by which we came. Wise guys know to change course. And finally, wise guys take the light home with them. The passage, the passage that we heard read is the lighter side of the epiphany tale. And we come to perhaps the darker side of this passage, the verses just following, the mass execution that Herod is said to decree against all the Israelite boys under two years old. If it sounds familiar, it's because the story is almost word for word in keeping with the Exodus story 
of Hebrew male children being killed at Pharaoh's decree. Now, scholars have a bunch of different views on this. There, there are some who say that it played out differently from what we read in Matthew. Flavius Josephus, who is a historian from the time period, a Jewish historian, made a list, a long list of, of Herod's atrocities, but he makes no mention of this one. And we see that in the Gospel of Luke. Similarly, there's no story about the Holy Family running away to Egypt. There's no story about Herod trying to end the life of baby Jesus, but it is here in Matthew. And so what is at the heart of this sordid tale? Whether Matthew is painting a poetic account or conveying facts blow by terrible blow, the point remains. These things do happen. But he wants us to understand that even in a world that is rife with demonic and destructive opposition to God's will, God's will prevails. The Christ child survives in spite of enemies in high places because his father sits higher still. The holy innocents, the children Herod presumably ordered to be killed, reminds us, remind us of the atrocities this world witnesses and yet points toward a redemption that would again take the Israelite readers of Matthew's gospel back to the origins of Moses, back to Exodus, the first liberator of the it's his life when Pharaoh ordered all the Hebrew boys to be killed so that God could work out his purposes for God's people in the earth. And in Christ, Matthew shows us, Christ's life is also saved so that he might work out the purpose of inviting all the earth to become the people of God. And that invitation is the truest light of epiphany the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has not put it out, try though it might. But that light, John reminds, shines in the darkness, not around it. The holy innocents foreshadow the death of the firstborn, not of Pharaoh's palace, like in the Exodus story, not of Herod's, but the firstborn of the kingdom of heaven. Because this little baby whose parents help him escape to Egypt and bring him back again, like the first Israelites, this child will grow and will indeed know the hand of violence by power and will indeed face death, spiritual and physical, for the world he created, for each and every one of us, and for each and every person who has ever done wrong. And so we can read with confidence that passage in Hebrews that says, we don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality, and neither should we be, because the heart of God beats for and the hands of God bled for the lost boys and girls of Nigeria, for the hostages of incessant violence in Yemen, for the abused spouses and the hungry children of our streets, every one of them is holy because God's image is on them and in them. And every one of them is loved, even when love is not shown them by a hostile world. And God's heart beats and the hands of God bled for every single person over this past year who has had to say goodbye, who has had to be intubated, who has lost a job, who has looked up and wondered, why is this happening to me? The heart of God beats for each single one of those people, each single one of us. And this is epiphany. It's not just the journey to the house in Bethlehem. It's the journey home. It's taking the light home with us. And there are a few words that so eloquently sum it all up as a poem that was shared with me, for which I'm grateful to Christine Housel at the World Council of Churches. It's a short poem. I'll close with this. It's called When the Song of Angels is Stilled, written by Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace 
among the people, to make music in the heart. May we go forward by God's grace into this year as wise women and men seeking to follow. May we walk in a life-giving, life-breathing wisdom. And may God's light shine on us and set our hearts on fire with love for Christ and for the world that one little baby came to save. And so I would invite us, as we reflect on what it means to seek God's wisdom, to to share in the reading of Psalm 90, the only psalm in the entirety of the book written, attributed to Moses, a prayer recognizing our need for wisdom. So I'll read the first verse, and I invite you to read the verses in bold in alternation. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. O Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us for as many years as we have seen trouble. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And so we join with the prayer of Moses, prayers from our own hearts. In this new year, loving Lord of all, might you be glorified. Cause your face to shine upon us and we shall be saved. We praise you, Father of lights, for you are without change or deception. We praise you for your hand and your guidance through this tumultuous year past, for your comfort in times of grief, for your encouragement through the small and grand actions of others, through the perpetual exhortation of your word made flesh and his intercession for us. Be now present with us in our hopes and hesitation that we might advance your loving kingdom in the places you have placed us. Cause your face to shine upon us and we shall be saved. All wise one, how excellent is your name in all the earth. May your kingdom come to the broken, the impoverished in our streets and byways, those whose accounts are full, but whose souls are empty. 
May our leaders, both in this country and those of our origins, know your guidance. And may you establish the godly work of their hands. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Father, we commit to you the state of our world, the state of the pandemic, and we hear the reminder that we are but dust. Yet in your mercy, preserve the people you created, for whom your son, that blessed child of Bethlehem, that man of Nazareth, was sent. Where peace is hard found, there let yours be that which passes understanding. Where grace and greed compete, my grace went out all the more. Where the innocents are forced to flee, there may streams of justice flow and balms of healing for the afflicted. To you we lift the countries of Yemen, of Ethiopia, Syria. We bring before you Palestine, home of that sacred city, Bethlehem, where your son first laid his head, place of conflict and hotbed of uncertainty. Might the Prince of Peace return, no longer as an infant in swaddling, but in the hands and feet of his followers, a tribe above tribes, a kingdom peaceable. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we come to the collect, the the prayer written especially for this Sunday of Epiphany. O oh God, who by the leading of a star didst manifest thy only begotten Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we, which know thee now by faith, may after this life have the fruition of thy glorious Godhead, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I invite us all to bring these prayers together in the words that our Savior taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we come to a blessing for the people of God. The spirit of truth, lead us into all truth. Give us grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain on us this night and always. Amen. So we come to our announcements. And I don't think that there are any announcements, but then again, but then again, I'm a visitor here. So I'll just take this time to say that my announcement is thank you so much, both to those online, to those directly in front of me in both senses for, for allowing me to share in this time of worship. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? No? Okay, all right. Well then, thank you so much. Be blessed. Have a great continuation of this year. God bless. First of all, thank you very much, Kieran, who left uh, the plane to come up here and uh, uh, take the service tonight. Thank you. Hope to see you again. A uh, few little thing is that uh, Bible study will uh, start again, not this Wednesday, but the following one, which I think is the 13th of uh, January, uh, which is, is a Wednesday at six o'clock. Clive, I think he'll be back to next week. Another thing is every year, Marilyn always uh, preached that, is that if you have uh, postcard, Christmas postcard, or any nice postcard, and stamps, instead of throw them down in the bin, bring it over to us and we'll give it to the old people's home, which they always have, always have a good use, a good uh, uh, use of it.
uh, any time. I mean, is, there is no, it could be next week or the following week. There'll be a box outside there and um, we'll be very thankful for that. That's all, thank you very much. Another little thing, I'm sorry, to avoid uh, always this distant business, if you mind to go to the right hand side and go out from the other door. Uh, there is also a box, if by chance you have thought about to bring some offering, the box is there ready for you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Feel free to sit back down again, <laughs> unless you're unless you're trying to catch your train. I I got a little flipped by by the order. Thanks so much, by the way, to Guy for for ordering this for us. We're going to continue with our last hymn, which is "Great Is Thy Faithfulness." Uh, there was there was something in my mind that thought, no, nah, it feels like it's not quite over. And thanks as well to Jennifer and Eric Breiner. They're from our congregation in Bobe and have supplied us with, with the hymns that we've, we've listened to today. So if you like, feel free to listen to this. And then truly, I think we'll, we'll be, we'll, we will have finished. So.
And so now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.